Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you again for inviting me and even more thank you again for organizing this seminar series in the first place. Uh, and um, okay, first I would like to spend a couple of words about my lab uh, because it's it's actually not a laboratory which has a long history in uh, synthetic biology. Uh, the main uh, ex traditional expertise is optics. And in particular, um, they use the control of, they use light to control, for example, bacteria motility, as you shown, see here. This is basically a dynamic portrait made of bacteria. And using light, you can regulate the motility of the speed and the tumbling rate of bacteria and make these pictures. Another um, field in the lab is microfabrications. As you can see, for example, here there are these tiny wheels. And in this wheel, you can make bacteria go in them and move them. So this is just a ratchet, but you can also build more complex structures like the one uh, seen in here. These are small microbots. Again, there are bacteria powering them. And you can see the light and the bacteria to guide the small microbots uh, to reach certain targets. So this is what the, let's say, the traditional uh, works from this lab. But from the for the work I'm gonna talk to you about today, our starting uh, question was actually about oscillators. And you all know that oscillators are very important components in physics and electronics, and they are fundamental tools to keep track of the passing of time. But oscillators can also have a similar role in biological systems. Um, for example, in development, you can see here uh, the example of somite segmentation. But biological oscillators are, all, are also involved in uh, um, phenomenon we face every day, like the sleep-wake cycle called the circadian rhythm. Now, you know that biological systems like this one shown here are very complex, extremely sophisticated networks. And so they're very hard to study. And an alternative approach is the one of uh, synthetic biology, which means starting from scratch and building a simpler network and then gradually build complexity on top of that. And indeed one of the very first uh, circuit in the synthetic biology field was the repressilator. The repressilator is this uh, minimal network here that behaves as an oscillator. You have these three proteins, the TAR, the I, and LACI. Each of them represses one of the others in a circular manner. So for example, the red protein, LACI, represses the protein the TAR, as you can see signaled here. So if the red protein is present, the blue protein can't be produced anymore as it would otherwise be. In the first version of the circuit, which you can see here, made in 2000, uh, they could track the oscillation using a GFP reporter. And you can see it's having a uh, steady, even if noisy, very noisy oscillations with a period of around 150 minutes. Uh, this circuit has then been uh, refactored in several or um, emulated in several occasions. And the version I'm going to use is this one from 2016, where they used the three fluorescent reporters to track each of the oscillators, oh, sorry, each of the proteins. And they uh, changed the system so that the oscillator are, the oscillation are much more steady even if the, the period is much longer than the original one, and it's around 18 hours. Um, to um, formulate this, the behavior of this circuit in a, from a mathematical point of view, we used a system of uh, protein-only differential equations. Uh, now, the reason we are able to um, make this work looking just at the proteins and not, for example, at the dynamics of the mRNA is exactly because the um, oscillation of the system are hours, are at the length of hours, and so there's no 
fast dynamics in it. Uh, anyway, we have these three equations. They're all symmetrical. Each of the equations represents the change in uh, concentration of one of the proteins over time. If, for example, if you look at the first equation, see that the first part of it represents a protein production, and it's a classical repressed real function, while the second part of the equations represents the dilution of the protein caused by growth. Uh, now, this is all fine when you have a single bacterium, but in reality, you usually have a multitude of bacteria. So each bacteria is going to have their own parameters, both for, uh, the, for uh, protein production and for uh, growth. And the growth in particular, we found it's very important. It's a very important source of noise in the speed with which the oscillators proceed. And we can, the, uh, since there is this noise in the speed bacteria have in oscillating, uh, there is, uh, even if the population is initially synchronized, it's eventually going to lose synchronization over time. And we can test this uh, very easily using, for example, a chemical inhibitor. You can see here, uh, IPTG can block the repression of LACAI on TETAR. And so if we look at the population of bacteria treated with TETAR, uh, with, uh, sorry, IPTG, like here, and we look at the level of the blue protein, so that if we remove the uh, chemical inhibitor and we let the system proceed, the population of bacteria will gradually do synchronization over time. So you see the, this is actual uh, experimental data. You see that the oscillation becomes gradually damp until they reach an almost straight line to, towards the end and they will keep losing synchronization over, over time. And we can see this again by looking at the behavior of all of the three proteins. For example, here, this is a simulation. Each of the axes represents the concentration of one of the proteins. And these balls are the position of bacteria in this concentration space. And you can see that even if the bacteria are forced in the same uh, starting position, since the bacteria all have a slightly different speed in oscillating, eventually the population is going to lose synchronization over time. And the even this is even in, if the individual oscillators keep oscillating as the, as at, the, at the beginning, this is just loss of synchronization between individual bacteria. So we asked ourselves, can we control these independent genetic clocks using light? And the um, reason to use light for this is that light is a very, very precise and versatile tool to control bacterial gene expression and in general biological process. Both over time and over space, you can control precisely when you deliver it, when you remove it, how much you give it in intensity. And you can see a couple of, a couple of examples here. For example, here you can see this individual bacteria are being target, targeted by a specific pattern of activation and inactivation using light. And this very fast uh, change between activation and uh, uh, inhibition is possible using light. Uh, and instead here at the bottom, this is the epithelium of a Drosophila embryo. And uh, researchers are uh, inducing the invagination of this epithelium using light inputs. So you can see, for example, here, they can decide what's the shape that they want to induce the, um, the invagination of. And this kind of precise uh, delivery of signal is only possible through, through light. The, um, our proposed mechanism to develop light control of the repressilator is this one. You are basically adding a second copy of the red protein, which is controlled just by light inputs and not by the original circuit dynamics. Uh, the way this optogenetic module work, works is using the uh, CCAS, CCAR um, optogenetic system. CCAS is this uh, membrane um, protein. It gets activated using green light. 
while if it's exposed to just red light, it's not active. So it doesn't give any signal to CCR, which is a transcription activator. And so with red light, there is basically no gene expression from this specific light-driven promoter here. While with green light, the sensor is activated, it activates CCAS, and so this turns on gene expression from this promoter, and there is an influx of red protein in the system. The overall intended behavior of, of this is that with red light, the circuit oscillates just as, the, as it did before, while with green light, there is the additional red protein, which is getting the system stuck uh, in a fixed level of gene expression. Um, mathematically, what we are doing is adding like a second copy of the X protein, uh, which is just regulated by the light intensity, which is this parameter here. Uh, and it acts, acts just the same as X in repressing the Y protein. Now, again, this is what we were uh, um, expecting to see on the red light. Uh, and I think all the experimentalists listening to this will understand me if I say that our first attempt to physically build the system was like this. So no oscillations at all. Uh, and this is because actually this version of the equation is a bit too simplistic. There's always a certain amount of promoter leakage. And in this case, uh, promoter leakage was enough so that the there was too much red, pro red protein and the system could not oscillate anymore. And you can see here that if you increase too much the unregulated production of red protein, the limit cycle of the oscillation is first shrinked and then completely uh, destroyed by this leakage. Uh, now the obvious thing to do here would be to just reduce the leakage. But we're, I mean, we're not dealing with a system of equation. We are doing real, with an actual biological network. And reducing the leakage, just the leakage means doing with a very sophisticated work of um, making the, this specific light driven promoter better. Which is not even very, again, sophisticated, but it has also already been uh, done in literature several times. Like the one presented now, it's already the result of a lot of optimization. So what we did instead to circumvent this problem is we used a more general approach to reduce the overall transcription and translation efficiency of the gene so that the overall effect of the leakage is decreased. Um, I will tell you more in detail what is uh, this approach and why I think it's uh, much more broadly um, can be applied in much more uh, other um, cases. So again, here we have our original construct, which is not oscillating. Here, um, to keep track of the level of gene expression that we are delivering to this system, we have the same uh, gene expression conditions with a fluorescent reporter. And uh, first thing to, to do is to, to reduce the level of gene expression. We change the ribosome binding site, which is the part of the mRNA that regulates how many proteins are produced from a single mRNA molecule. And you can see here, by changing the ribosome binding site with a weaker, less efficient version, we are, uh, we are having two effects. The first is we are reducing the range of gene expression, which we don't really want. But more importantly, we are uh, lowering the lowest level of gene expression which are, which can, we can achieve with just red light, which is what we are actually interested in. Uh, but this was still not enough to um, produce a circuit that could oscillate. Uh, our second strategy was to affect the copy number of the gene. And this because at the beginning, the this promoter was located on a high copy plasmid. And we thought, well, why don't we um, reduce the copy number of the gene so that we have actually less mRNA molecules produced in the first place? So we moved the custom to the genome. This is the stronger abs version. And you can see that, again, the lowest level of gene expression 
is getting is getting lowered, which is what we want. Um, and then, oh, so okay, sorry, spoiler. <laughs> the, uh, uh, but this was still not enough. So then we combined the two approaches, and we made a concert with weak ribosome binding site um, and low copy number. And this version of the circuit was finally able to oscillate under um, red light. And we call this the opto-repressilator. Uh, but as, as I said, uh, a secondary effect of affecting gene expression in this way is that we reduced the range of gene expression. So after showing the system can oscillate uh, un until red light, we need to prove that we can actually affect it using green light. And we didn't just reduce the um, impact of the system too much. Now, uh, again, before I said that the growth rate is very important. So we always start to look for ways to keep the population in uh, constant growth conditions, ideally exponential growth conditions for a long period of time to measure the behavior of the system. And the first kind of experiments we did uh, was using uh, uh, liquid cultures. We basically um, used a 96 well plate and we um, put an eight for eight um, LED array like shown here so that we can um, target individual wells of the plate with the side light inputs. And then we would like set different light conditions for different wells, put our cultures there. And then, like every couple of hours, refresh the bacteria in uh, new rows of the plate uh, so that they will stay in exponential conditions while we measure them. We can see the result of one of these experiments here. We are, for, for both uh, samples, we are looking at the blue protein, the DAR, but the black line is the original repressilators, and the blue line is our opto-repressilator. And you can see them here, they are flat because the population is not synchronized. While when we send a light input to the sample, our system responds to it. And even more importantly, when we remove the light input, you can now detect synchronous oscillations in the population because light managed to get the population synchronized over time. And so this single long light input was enough to um, almost completely synchronized the population. Um, then, as I mean, as you can expect, after a single input of, uh, of um, synchronization, the population is slowly getting desynchronized again over time. Uh, the second kind of experiments we did was focused on the behavior of individual oscillators. Uh, and for this, we used a modern machine device, which is a microcode chip which is uh, built as shown here. Here there is a big channel with a constant flow of fresh medium going, going like this. And then there are smaller lateral channels, like shown here, and bacteria can enter the channel. And then the bacteria at the bottom of the channel that gets stuck in a fixed position in space and in constant growth conditions tend to the constant flow of fresh medium and it can grow and it can divide. And you can imagine them for long periods of time. And here we have the um, experiment, one of our experiments. We are again looking at the TAR, but we are not synchronized at the beginning. We send light, the expression goes off, remove light, and the bacteria are now much more synchronized than they were before. Even though, as you can see, the, the population is gradually losing synchronization again over time. So we um, asked ourselves if instead of using a single long light input, what happens if we start from a population that is not synchronized and then we use shorter light inputs repeated over time and see if, it, if this is enough to keep the population synchronized for longer. Now, this is again a, a simulation, but here, Yes, you can see um, on top uh, an experiment uh, in, again, in mother machine. 
And then here in the bottom, you can see the tracks from the experiment shown above. The gray lines are the individual channels, while the blue line is the average between all the channels. And you can see that the average uh, is following very well the trains of light inputs and it's staying synchronized for longer period of time. Now, this was uh, very nice. Um, then we begin looking at what individual oscillators were doing in this. I highlighted a couple of them here. And you can see like they're both following the light inputs, but they're doing it in, in different ways. So for example, the dark oscillator was very slow at the beginning, makes, makes a very slow oscillation. Uh, and then it's always receiving the light inputs in the peaks of gene expression. While the redwood oscillator, it was very fast at the beginning, makes two fast oscillations. And then it's always receiving the light input in the valley between two gene expression peaks. To understand this, we use some computational simulations. And we found that, um, for example, if you imagine a bacteria that is going with its own constant native frequency, if you send a light input on what would have been a peak of gene expression, this is always a peak of the blue protein. So the peak of the blue protein is getting killed by light, and so the additional production of red protein. And the next oscillation is getting anticipated in time respect to when it would have been. So the um, phase shift is, is positive, while if you send a uh, light input on what would have been the valley between two gene expression peaks. Uh, in this moment, uh, the blue protein is, is decaying, and this additional light input is prolonging the decay of the blue protein. And so the next peak of gene expression is delayed in time respect to when it would have been, resulting in a negative phase shift. Um, we can quantify this behavior using a phase response curve as shown here. Here we have the pulse arrival time and here the phase shift. And you can see that if the pulse is negative respect to the peak of gene expression, there's gonna be a positive phase shift of a certain amount. And instead if the phase shift, sorry, if the pulse is positive, it's gonna create a negative phase shift of a certain amount predicted by this phase response curve. Um, uh, this is our theoretical prediction based on the parameters we extracted from, um, from the growth of the sample, but here are the theoretical data. Sorry, these are the experimental data we got from experiment. You can see that they're following very well the theoretical prediction. Um, and of course, the shape of this phase response curve like would change if we change the intensity or the time of exposure of light. You can see here, for example, tau is the um, length of the light input, while beta prime is basically the light intensity we are using. And uh, if we change these parameters, the shape of the phase response, response curve changes, but they're basically, you can, basically um, they're interchangeable. Now that you can, like, if you affect one or the others, you, you have the same kind of, of behavior. Um, a very interesting thing about this phase response curve is that now we can understand the data with the modern machine data we saw before. So for example, we have the dark oscillator, which was slow. It's getting anticipated every time by receiving the light on the peak of gene expression, while the redwood oscillator, which is fast, is getting delayed every time by receiving the input in the valley between gene expression peaks. And uh, both of these mechanisms are contributing to keep the population, the rural population synchronized. Um, uh, okay, uh, then, uh, you know already oscillators are going with their uh, native frequency. Here, what is shown here is the average native frequency of the population. 
And so far, when we send light inputs, we always used a forcing frequency, F, which was comparable to the native frequency of the bacteria. Um, of course, you can imagine to uh, decrease this frequency or increase this frequency. And all of these cases, um, they can actually be experimental conditions. You can put them on one axis. And this becomes the X axis of this plot shown, shown here, okay? While the Y axis of this plot is the ratio between the actual population frequency and the forcing frequency. So just to be clear, this here is the average frequency if the bacteria are not affected, while this frequency here is the actual uh, frequency which will bacteria oscillate when they are affected by the light inputs, okay? Um, the other parameter here is the forcing amplitude, basically the strength of the light inputs. And so far we are only focusing on here, which means basically the strongest light input possible. Okay. And this, for example, this blue plateau here that you can see, what it means is that there is this very big range of frequencies. Okay, so these frequencies, for all of these frequencies, the ratio between population frequency and forcing frequency is always one. So there's always one oscillation in the population per one light input. And you can see it here, even if the like the how close these are changes through the uh, plateau, there's always uh, a ratio of one to one between the population oscillation and the and the and the light signals. Um, then there is uh, if we decrease the first in frequency, there is this jump. Until we and here the, there is another plateau, like a magenta plateau, at value two, which means that here there is two oscillation in the population per one light input. While instead, if we increase the first in frequency, we jump to this other plateau here, where you have a ratio of zero point five, meaning there's one oscillation of the population per two light inputs. These plateaus, for those familiar with uh, synchronization, these plateaus are the ones called uh, annulled tones. And uh, again, this is a simulation, but then we tested experimentally to see if this was actually happening in, in real life. And first we um, used uh, liquid cultures to, to test this. And if we start from the top here, you can see that the experiment are following very well the what was predicted theoretically. So here, for example, you have two oscillation in the population per one light input. Uh, then there is the big blue plateau here with one oscillation that is equivalent to this, one oscillation in the population per one light input. Uh, but then um, apparently no matter how much we increased the first in frequency, we would always see the ratio of population and, and, light, and light oscillation being one-to-one. -one. And this was a bit puzzling at the beginning. Then we made a mother machine experiment. And as you can see here, what we found out is that the individual channels were actually behaving as was expected in this case. It's just that different, like different channels set each other on different trains of light inputs. And so if you just look at the average behavior, you have the impression of the ratio between frequencies being one, while it's actually 0 0.5, as was expected with the simulations. Now, uh, this is the same, the exact same plot as before, uh, but before we focused on this side of the plot, where the forcing amplitude was at maximum. Uh, but you can see here, if we decrease the forcing amplitude, there are areas in which bacteria don't fall in either of the plateaus, which I said before. And indeed, we uh, here we show what uh, what happens at this, this, this level 
of forcing amplitude and this other level of forcing amplitude. These are uh, 0 0.01 and 0 0.02 is this more intermediate one here. And when the, if we look at what happens directly inside the plateau, the behavior of bacteria are the same because these are the point of resonance of the, you know, if you have exactly the same frequency as the one bacteria oscillate, they will oscillate with same frequency also at lower forcing amplitudes. But what's more interesting is that in cases like this, this one here, when you see that there are, um, in this case, the bacteria are in the plateau, while for just low, uh, just a bit lower forcing amplitude, the bacteria outside of the plateau, plateau. This case is this, this one here. And you can see that for the weakest light intensity, bacteria are not synchronized, while for the um, a bit stronger light intensity, yeah, I mean, the ratio is one, even though the like the synchronization is not as full as it is in in other cases. And if you look at the um, intermediate um, levels, you can see in several cases outside of the plateau that the uh, level of the forcing amplitude affects more how much the bacteria are synchronized or not. Um, now. Um, uh, all of this, you can find it in our paper, which uh, just went out uh, two weeks ago, I think. Um, so feel free to check it out. If you uh, want any figures, you can tell me. The data are all online. Uh, in any case, feel free to contact me. Uh, before I conclude, I would like to say uh, uh, another small part of the story, which is uh, everything I've shown so far is clearly one way to implement how you can uh, build uh, oscillators which are sensitive to light and how you can study them. But of course, you can also do it in, in different ways. And indeed, in the period that it took for our work to be uh, fully published, another paper came out which made a very similar um, implementation. They also used the repressilator and made it uh, light uh, controllable. Um, and, um, and a very interesting thing is that even if they used a different system to it, not just a different optogenetic system, they use a different strategy to make the repressilator light controllable, the results are actually very consistent. So for example, if you see here, uh, this is a plot from this paper. Uh, here they have the period of the light input, and here they have the periods of the, oscill the oscillator. And you can see this line here, which is the equivalent of the blue plateau, the blue Arnold tongue we saw before in the um, in, in the plot uh, a bit before. Uh, so I think it, it's nice that the results are, I mean, not always in size, you find stuff actually being so reproducible, uh, which is nice. So I would like to uh, thank again the organizers for inviting me uh, and you for uh, your attention and all of my lab members and in particular my PI, which is on the top here and all the members that uh, help the most with this, uh, with this work.